I want for us this morning to think about praise. Okay? So I want to, to think about praise and, and what is praise, particularly praise to God. Right? You, you can praise other people, but I, I just think about praise to God. You know, hundreds of times in the Scriptures, we, we read of people praising God. Uh, in one form of another, from Moses in the wilderness to David in Jerusalem to the exiles coming back from the land. Time and time again, we just read of people praising God. After the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea, Moses writes this in Exodus 15, 5, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. This is my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. David wrote in Psalm 34, verse 1, his own testimony, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When they returned to exiles, laid the foundation of the new temple that they would build, they gathered together, and and Ezra 3.11 tells us that they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And that's Old Testament, and you also see it in the New Testament as well. In the, in the days of the birth of Jesus, we find praise of God. A multitude of the heavenly host was praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. And even at the death of Jesus, we see a centurion praising God when he saw all that had happened. It says in Luke twenty three forty seven that he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Hundreds of times in the Bible we, we see people praising God. Hundreds of times in the Bible we hear of commands to praise the Lord. Just consider like Psalm 113, how it begins. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. Just again and again, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just over and over and over again. Now, from all this, what's interesting is it's difficult sometimes to understand exactly what praise is. Right? Just even a little audience participation here. If I would say, what, what, what is praise? How would you define it or how would you explain it? Really, just oh, what, what is praise? Giving thanks. Giving thanks. Good. That's an aspect of praise for sure. Open adoration, good. Sorry, what? Elevating Elevating God, right? Lifting Him up, good. Being thankful, thankful. good. Acknowledging Acknowledging Him and His goodness. Acknowledging His goodness, acknowledging His greatness, acknowledging His his omniscience, and acknowledging His omnipotence. Like, just acknowledging who God is, for sure. Any others? His existence. His existence. Yeah, just acknowledging his, that He is there. God, you are there. Praying to Him. Yeah. Yeah, just a meditation, just thinking about the Lord. Just if we think about praising God, it means like, like giving tribute to God. I don't feel a way to say it. Her honoring God, worship. Worship is a word we really haven't used. Loving, adoring, respecting, acknowledging. Right? Some synonyms that are often used in the Scriptures. Exalt, extol, give thanks, bless, glorify, magnify, adore. In fact, consider the verses I read earlier. Exodus 15, 1. This is my Father's God. Exodus 15, 2. This is my Father's God and I will praise Him. I'm sorry, this is my God and I will praise Him. This is my Father's God and I will exalt Him. Praising God is the same as exalting God. Or as David wrote, Psalm 34, verse 1, that I read before, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. There's, there's praise and there is blessing, the same thing. And when the exiles came back, they sang praising God and giving thanks. Like, like all these sorts of synonyms are there is what it means to, to praise God. And, and let, me just, let me just give you a, a simple definition, right? Confess His place and our place. Just acknowledge who He is as the, the Creator, the Sovereign One, 
over all of us and who we are. We are His dependent ones who follow Him. That's what it means to praise God. And perhaps Psalm 48 verse 1 sums it up as well as any place. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God is great and He is great to be praised as we just think about His greatness. Now, I bring this up because for the next few weeks at Rock Valley Bible Church, I want for us to think about praising the Lord and want to do so from the book of Psalms. And so this morning, I invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 146. It's right there at the end of the Psalms. This is our text this morning, and the title of my message this morning is, Praise the Lord, O My Soul. And I know that many of you perhaps are expecting me to get back in the book of Acts. Uh, we've been working through the book of Acts for a, a season now. Um, but yet with summertime, with so many people in and out, in and out I thought just a, a time coming back from vacation, really just reflecting upon some psalms. Psalms, they stand independent of one another. So if people are on vacation last week and they come next week, they're going to hear the same thing for five weeks that we're going to look at. Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, 150. Now, in some regards, all psalms stand on their own. So I uh, it's summertime is a good time to look at the Psalms. In fact, a, a church we visited this summer in First B, First Baptist Church in Durango, Colorado, they're doing a series called Summer in the Psalms. Um, I've done that similar thing as well. Summer in the Psalms is, uh, is, is a good thing to do. Um, and we'll get back into Acts kind of after these. Um, but these summer months, a good, good time to look at these Psalms that stand on their own. But there are sometimes in the Psalms where there are groups of Psalms that come together. Like the Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 120 through 134, the, the Psalms that Israel sang as they went up to worship the Lord. Or the, the Psalms of Asaph, Psalms 73 through 83, all written by Asaph, along with Psalm 50. Why 50 is not included in there, I'm not exactly sure, but you have the Psalms of Asaph. Uh, the Psalms of, of Korah's sons are from 42 through 49, like just all clumped together. And, and this morning, we're going to look at one of these groups of Psalms. It's called the Alleluia Psalms. Like the Alleluia Psalms, Psalm 146 through 150, and they're called the Alleluia Psalms. Anyone know why they're called the Alleluia Psalms? Anyone know why? They all start with Alleluia and end with Alleluia. In fact, let's, let's just look at that. If you look at Psalm 146, it begins with Alleluia. Actually, it begins in our English Bibles with praise the Lord. But praise the Lord is a translation of the Hebrew word, Alleluia. Hallel is the word for praise, and Yah is a shortened name for God's name. Yahweh is His name. Yah is a shortened form of that. So Alleluia, Allelu is a command, praise Yah, praise Yahweh. You know that song maybe you've sung as a kid, you remember it says, Allelu, 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 Alleluia praise ye the Lord, right? We could sing that. We're not going to sing that right now. But the idea is the words to that song are simply alleluia, 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 because alleluia, 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 praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord, alleluia. And it goes back and forth. It just says the same thing, though. Praise the Lord. That's what alleluia means. And we see that there in the very first line of Psalm 146. It says, praise the Lord. It says, alleluia. And then at the end, look at verse 10. It says, praise the Lord. In the Hebrew, that is Alleluia. And the same pattern comes in Psalm 147. Look at there in verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord. And then at the end of verse 20, it says, Praise the Lord. Psalm 148, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens, right? Praise Him in the heights. It's all about praising. In Psalm 148, verse 14 at the end, it says, Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Okay, so Psalm 149, how does it start? It starts with, Praise the Lord. Right? And how does Psalm 149 end in verse 9? Praise the Lord. How about Psalm 150? Praise the Lord. And Psalm 150 verse 6 says, praise the Lord. Now do you know, you see why they're called the Alleluia Psalms? As a side note, there are a few other Psalms that have this characteristic that begin with Alleluia and end with Alleluia. Um, you know, particularly Psalm 106 and Psalm 113. And they are grouped with some Psalms that either begin or end with Alleluia. So there are some other Alleluia Psalms, but none of them are like close and bound together like these five. And, and, and really, you think about the one thing these Psalms are teaching us. I've been studying this all week to try to figure out what's, just, what's the one main point of all these Psalms are trying to teach us. 
then we might praise the Lord, right? And really, that's the application for us this morning and next Sunday morning and next Sunday morning and the next and the next is that we would praise the Lord. That's my aim through this series is that we just think about praising the Lord. Right? We know how to praise the Lord. We know why to praise the Lord, that we would grow in our worship of the Lord. And that's, that's, that's what these psalms really teach us. And I love how the English Standard Version uh, puts an exclamation point after the alleluias. Alleluia! Bang! Right? Alleluia! Praise the Lord! Exclamation point. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul! Exclamation point. Right? Now, there are no explanation points in Hebrew. That's a, it's an English interpretation, but I think it's exactly right. An explanation point really serves in, in our language a strong emotion or intensity. And that's what these Alleluia Psalms are about. It's a strong emotion, intensity that we need to praise the Lord. It's a strong call for all of us to Alleluia. So let's begin. I want to read for us Psalm 146. Read this in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that very day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked He brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. And as Gage taught us, right? This is the Word of God. How's it go? This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, right? I, I like that. That's good. Well, the title of my message this morning is Praise the Lord, O My Soul. And that first point comes from verses 1 and 2. In these verses, we see the psalmist simply calling us to resolve to praise the Lord. So not only is it just praising the Lord, it's just a, a personal resolve that I'm going to praise the Lord. It's a, a desire and a will and a passion that the, the psalmist here says what he's going to tell himself. He says this, he says, praise the Lord. He says, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It's as if he is speaking to himself. He says, O oh my soul, right? Soul, praise the Lord. And, and really, that's the idea of my point, right? You need to have resolve to, to praise the Lord. It's sort of like the Olympic marathon runner. Who's, who's, who's running along, and he's been, he's been chugging along for many, many miles, and he hits about the 20-mile mark or the 22-mile mark, and, and his body is hurting at that point. And, and do you know what his body is telling him? He's saying, I'm hungry, yeah, but probably something different than I'm hungry. Stop running! Stop doing what you're doing! It hurts! And the marathon runner, if he would listen to his body, what would he do? He'd stop, but he doesn't, because why? He's got this resolve to keep on going, and his mind is telling his body, um, no, shut up down there. We're going to keep going. we got four miles and 385 yards here to finish here this uh, marathon, and we're going to just keep going. And it's a resolve that a marathon runner has in his heart that he's just got to keep on finishing. It's the only way for a marathon runner to prevail is if his mind, he's saying, body, keep running, body, keep running. And so likewise, the psalmist here says, soul, praise the Lord. In the Christian life, that's the way it works. We need to talk to ourselves. We need to have a resolve. Not to listen to our bodies and what they want, but we need to tell our souls what our souls ought to want. And it's not the only place in the Bible this type of thing happened. Do you remember Psalm 103? I put it right here. Uh, up there for you, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, David says this, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. David's here talking to his soul. And he's saying, soul, bless the Lord. Which, by the way, is a little bit like praise. It's exactly the same thing. Bless the Lord, let all that is within me, all, all of my soul, bless His holy name. Kind of draws David even at the end of Psalm 103 to finish the same way. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And, and similarly here in Psalm 146, praise the Lord, O my soul, practical parallels. Right? Soul, give honor to God. Acknowledge God. Lift Him up. Exalt Him. Extol Him. Bless Him. Put Him in proper place. Let us be in our proper place. Let me be in my proper place. Right? It all begins with this resolve. You know, and, and this idea of talking your soul also comes in Psalm 42 and 43. In this case, the psalmist is, is facing dejection and, and discouragement. And three times in these two psalms, he says this exact same phrase. He says this in Psalm 42, verse 5, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise Him, my salvation and my God. He's just saying, he's acknowledging just how, how down he is in his spirit. And he's talking to himself and telling himself, right, soul, hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him. And, and then he just reminds him of who God is. He is my salvation, my God. He's my God. He's my salvation. So, so hope in Him. Don't be downcast. Um, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this, this great book. It's called uh, Spiritual Depression. And um, really, he picked it from this verse. And uh, he, 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 sa he says this. I don't want to read this, this all. I can't read the whole book. But there's a, there's a long quote. I just want to pick some of this. But he's talking about this verse right here, and he speaks about spiritually depressed people. He says, the first thing we have to learn is what the psalmist learned. We must learn to take ourselves in hand. This man is not just content just to lie down and commiserate with himself. He does something about it. He takes himself in hand. He does something which is more important still. That is, he talks to himself. This man turns to himself and says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? He's talking to himself. He's addressing himself. But, says someone, I'm sorry, let's go. But how do, let's see, how this. We must talk to ourselves instead of allowing ourselves to talk. Do you realize what this means, he says? I suggest that the main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression, in a sense, is this, that we allow ourselves to talk to us instead of our talking to ourselves. And he says, this is the very essence of wisdom in this manner. So when depression comes, or when you're losing sight of God, or when you don't quite feel like it, or when you rather spend time sleeping, or whether you rather right, spend time on your boat on Sunday, or when you rather just do something else, he says, no, soul, I need to praise the Lord. Right? When things look down, no, soul, I need to bless the Lord. Right? When, when, when things are troubled, he says, no, soul, right? hope in God. Right? I shall praise Him. My help and my countenance is God. And in fact, he even says this, the, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. He says, you have to take yourself in hand. You have to dress yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. And it's a matter of depression. That's how you get over that. And so likewise, in Psalm 146, this, this idea of praising, right? the psalmist is talking to himself. He says, I'm going to praise God. I've got this resolve that I am going to praise the Lord, regardless what's happening in my life, regardless how things are going on in my life, regardless of how he feels, regardless how tired he is, regardless how difficult things are, he's telling his soul to praise the Lord. And, and then look at his, his pledge or his own promise or his own resolve in verse 2. He says, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. This is resolve. This is determination. This is commitment. And the psalmist says, basically, this is a non-negotiable in my life, that I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Right? So if I'm living, 
I'm praising. If I'm breathing even, is what he says, I am praising. Which, by the way, sounds a lot like Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. As long as I have breath, I'm going to continue to praise the Lord. You know, sometimes we have this phrase, right? Over my dead body, right? Well, you're going to do that over my dead body, right? You're going to so much fight for this that that's only going to happen over my dead body, right? Maybe it's an extreme situation where someone's coming in, right, and they want to enter your house forcefully. You said, over my dead body, you're going to come in. And so likewise, he says, over my dead body will I stop praising the Lord. When I stop breathing, <laughs> but interesting here, the, the, the child of God, when he stops breathing, will be in the presence of Christ, worshiping Christ. So you just read Revelation 4 and 5 if you have any doubts about that. So it's almost like continuing. But in this life, as long as I'm living, I'm going to praise the Lord. This is non-negotiable commitment. And so I just ask about you, like, is this your resolve as well, that you have a, a resolve and a commitment to praise the Lord regardless of how things go, regardless of how you feel, I'm still going to exalt the Lord. Maybe you're like Job, right? And, and, and God takes away everything. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just an act of worship and praising the Lord here. Do you wake in the morning with a commitment to praise the Lord? And do you carry that throughout the day? It's what the psalmist is really calling us to do. Is that your heart's desire? It's Sunday mornings, right? I'm preaching the choir. Obviously, you're here, right? But is that just a, a, a deep-seated, like, this is the place where we can praise the Lord. This is the place where we gather communally with people, just individually all, all week long. But here we are together. We have a chance to praise the Lord together. You know, one of the things about, I love about va vacation is I get to go and sit, to go to church and just sit and worship, like without a care in the world. I just go, I can enjoy the songs, I can enjoy the scripture, I can enjoy the preaching. And uh, we were gone three Sundays from Rock Valley Bible Church. We're in church each of those three Sundays. Um, in fact, one Sunday we went to three churches, right? <laughs> we went to three churches Sunday morning, right? Visited uh, one church in the morning, but there was another church close by that we scoot over and then went to that and then went to a church plant to that, that later that night. And um, I, I, I just say that's my desire and that is my heart. Um, not because I feel like from any legalistic command that I need to do so, but just to have a desire to worship the Lord and to be with His saints, just to, just to encourage myself, right? To encourage my soul, like I need to go to the house of God. Right? Do you know what I mean? Is, is that your own resolve as, as well? Can you say, like in verse 2, I will praise the Lord as long as I live? As long as I have breath, I'll praise the Lord. Such is the resolve that must be there for praise. Well, let's look at my second point. Here we come. My second point, trust not in princes. I get this point straight from the command of verse 3. It says, put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there's no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Now, what, what this is, this is right, we need to exalt the Lord, right? We need to trust in Him, not in other people, not in even the most powerful people that are in our lives. The princes are like our government, our government officials, if you will. The earthly rulers, those who have authority in nations to give direction to the entire nation. Right? It, it, the equivalent here would simply say, don't trust government officials. How many of you find that difficult? Don't trust government officials. It's pretty easy for us to do especially in this day and age with so much conflict. It seems the government opposes us in every way with high taxes and legislating immorality, restricting our freedom and being quite unreasonable at times. It's easy for us not to trust our government. But I, I want you carefully to see what this is saying. Is it, it, it means that, that we ought not to trust in the government whatever political party is in control. In other words, right, it doesn't say that we should resist the party today so that we can put our party in because that's when it's going to be good. If you're saying that, you, my friend, are trusting in princes. See, it's not red or blue. It's not Republican or Democrat. He's saying don't trust any of them. Don't put your trust in the Lord. It's what verses 3 and 4 are, are calling for us. So if your hope is in a red wave this fall where we can return to the Trump days at lower gas price, less inflation, minimal global conflict, 
you may be trusting in princes. Like, oh, that's where things are going to be good. And, and, and this is where, right, it's praising the Lord, not the powers that be. Now, it's not to say we should abstain from the political scene. It's not to say we should become pacifists. Not all, but you know what God is involved in politics? It says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, that God removes kings and he sets up kings. So the kings that are in authority today are there because God has set them up. Really think about that. Proverbs 21, the, the heart of the king is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He moves it wherever he wills. He moves our kings, our princes, and our government officials where he wants. Romans 13, 1 says that God establishes all authority. Our, our current, current administration is there because God ordained it. But we're called, and as such, we're called to honor our government officials. Peter writes to those being persecuted by the government, those who are persecuting Christians, those who are putting tar over Christians and lighting them a fire. He says of them, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor, honor Nero. Far more wicked than any president that we've ever had. We need to honor him. So we play this balancing act, right? We don't trust our government. And here in the United States, we have freedom to work towards a better government. So let's do so. But let's do so while honoring those in authority at the same time. But here in Psalm 146, the idea is not to trust those in the government. They're not going to be our Savior. They're not going to save us. In fact, that's what verse 3 says. In the Son of Man in whom there's no salvation, the government's not going to save us. right? Because they're just going to pass away. Verse 4, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. So if you have a political leader that becomes your savior, well, that's, that's wonderful. All is good. I, I have some friends who just love, look back at the Reagan days. Right? Just That was the glory days of America. Well, Reagan, by the way, is dead. Right? He's not our savior anymore. He's out of power. He has zero power now. It's God who's in control. We need to look to the greatest of powers and we need to praise Him. And, and that's part of praising, is to demonstrate we're going to put our trust in Him and not in earthly people. And, and sadly, I would say that I think that many Americans find their hope and their salvation in the right governmental leaders. I, I, just, I think that they're just hoping that. Uh, I love the title of the book that John MacArthur wrote, Why Government Can't Save You. Government can't save you. That's the whole point. Don't trust in princes and the son of man in whom there is no salvation. And then he, he gives a good balance here. He says, a certain amount of healthy and balanced concern with current trends in government and the community is acceptable as long as we realize that such interest is not vital to our spiritual growth, our righteous testimony, or the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. Above all, the believer's political involvement should never displace the priority of preaching and teaching the gospel. He says this, the issue is one of priority. The greatest temporal good that we can accomplish through political involvement cannot compare to what the Lord can accomplish through us in the eternal work of His kingdom. Just as called, God called ancient Israel, He's called the church to be a kingdom of priests, not a kingdom of political activists. Let's put it there. We're a kingdom of priests, not political activists. We don't seek our salvation in the governmental rulers. So are you trusting in the government? you trusting in the government? Really? Maybe not those in power, but trusting in those who will rise in power to take over them? Do you think more about the government and its evils and its corrupt leaders and bad policy rather than upon the Lord and His goodness and His kindness and His power to save? What about your social media? What, what do you post on your social media? Is it more about the government? Or is it more about the Lord? It might just be an open book there, Right? You, you want to you know where someone's heart is, oftentimes I say just take out their checkbook or look at their bank statement. You see where their money goes, right? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's an indicator of your heart. Sometimes social media can be an indicator of the heart as well. Like where is, where is the emphasis? Don't trust in princes. Don't trust in the government. Don't trust in the government that's coming because it's going to be better. It's not going to be better. It may be better, but ultimately it's not going to, it's going to, it's not going to save Instead, what we should do, and this is praising the Lord, verses 5 through 10, is that we should find help in the Lord. It's my, my last and final point. I, I see that, and I get that point from verse 5. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. 
And so part of praising is putting our, help, our hope in God. Part of praising is, is finding our help in the Lord. Right? Place your hope in the Lord, not in governments. Placing your ho- hope in the Lord, not in other people or, or teachers or pastors or parents or friends. Hope in the Lord, that's where you will find your blessing. In fact, that's what verse 5 says. It says, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob. We are blessed when God is our helper. When the God of Jacob, that is the God of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the God of Israel, the God who brought the Messiah, the God of Jesus Christ, right? The, the, the God and Father Jesus Christ and the Lamb, right? That's the one. We trust Him. We are blessed in Him. And for the next five verses, it's interesting that the psalmist merely describes the God of Jacob. Speaks about who He is. Because core to worshiping and core to praising is to know who this God is. And lifting it up for what we know about God. And praising Him for that. And fundamentally, as we just go through these verses, we find that God can give us help. God is willing to give us help. And God indeed gives us help. I mean, look at verse 6. This is talking about how God is capable of giving help, us help. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And that's all they contain. Right? The heaven. That's the sky. That's the stars. And uh, the James Webb Telescope has begun telling us about how vast and big and large that is. Right? There's the heaven and, and the earth. Right? That's, that's everything, all the substance here of our lonely, pale, blue dot planet that we live on, and, and everything that is on the earth. And, and if you think about this for a while, just time prevents you from listing everything that's on the earth. Um, the atoms in the atmosphere, the birds and the bugs and the cattle and the cucumber and the dogs and the dinosaurs, the plants, the planets, the soil, and the sun. Listen, if God made it all, He can lend a helping hand to His creatures. That's the idea here, right? You're blessed if God is the one who's helping you. He's capable of it, and He's willing. I, I think that's what the last phrase in verse 6 is about, who keeps faith forever. You know, people will fail you, but God will never fail you. He's willing to help you. Right? Have you ever needed help from somebody? And maybe you're hesitant to ask them for help because, right, you're not quite sure whether they are, are willing to help. And so whenever we ask other people to help, we need to always weigh, are they really going to be willing to help me or not, right? If, if I need a lawnmower, my lawnmower breaks down. And so before I think about what I'm going to do, I think about I need to borrow a lawnmower. Do I go to my neighbor? Is he going to really be willing to give me the lawnmower? Or if the dishes need washing, and uh, I have children who can be called dishwashers too. Right? If I have my children and there's dishes to be washed, I'm going to ask them, are they going to be willing? You've got to weigh that. Or if my, I've got some project around the house I need to ask my husband about, right? Is you wise, right? Is my husband going to be you got, you, right? You understand what I'm talking about? You're always weighing this sort of thing in your mind? Not, not so with God. God is always willing to help. He's ready. He's ready. You just simply need to ask Him. He wants to help. And and your blessing comes when God is your helper. God can help. He's willing to help. And then verses 7 through 9, we see what God does. Indeed, He does help those who are in need. Look at verse 7. He says, He executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked He brings to ruin. And here is where the gospel shines so clearly in this psalm, that God helps those who need it. Like for the oppressed, who who through from whatever circumstance, they're just beaten down. Society's beating them down. It says that, that God gives justice to them. For the hungry, right? Those lacking food, who need just sustenance, God gives them food. They need that. God helps them. God gives that to them. Those in prison, He's the one that grants freedom. Now, that's not to say every prisoner gets out, but even in prison, you can have free people in prison. Remember Curtis last week? He's a free man and was in prison. 
For the blind, God gives sight. Right? To those who can't see, right, He opens their eyes. We just see the, the ministry of Jesus, right? For those who are sick, He healed them. For the lepers, He purified them. For the deaf, right, He gave them hearing. That's what God does. For those who are bowed down in forced submission, right, it says the Lord lifts them up. If people are, are, are again, being oppressed or being forced in, into submission, God is the one that takes them, he takes the humble from the ash heap and makes them sit with princes. Psalm 113 says that. And the foreigners in a strange land, susceptible to every, every con or, or, you know, they don't have resources when they run into problems. It says the Lord watches over them. He cares for the foreigner. He cares for the stranger. And finally, even the widow and the orphan, the, the Lord sustains them. Those who have no place else to go to. Those who can't go to mom and dad and, and, and ask for some help or some guidance or some financial help, whatever. They, God will be the father to the fatherless. And the orphan and the widow, the, the widow who's lost a husband and lost all means, God sustains them. And in fact, that's, that's the heart of God to reach out and help those who need help. And isn't that the gospel, right? That we all need help, right? We're sinners facing the judgment of God, condemned to hell unless we're rescued from our sins. In fact, we could easily add that to Psalm 146. You, you, you could write that down maybe, but that might, if that's not blasphemous, right? At the end of verse 9, right? The Lord forgives sinners too, right? Not only is the Lord... Right, watches over the sojourners, upholding the widow, right? but he also forgives sinners. And he does that through the sacrifice of his son, through the cross. So he died on the cross for our sins. And how blessed is the one whom Christ has helped and brought to himself. We simply need to believe and trust in Christ and believe that he is near the brokenhearted. That he loved to help those who cry out to him. That love to, to help those who bowed their knees to the Lord, right? And putting God in his place and putting us in our place. It's the one that Christ loves to come and help. By the way, this is fundamentally why we praise the Lord. Because of our redemption. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And Psalm 107, verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right? Say what? I'll give thanks to the Lord for He's good. And let those who have been redeemed say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble. And then Psalm 107 gives sev several testimonies of those who were in trouble. And God came and He was their help and He brought them out of the trouble. And so they're called then to give thanks to God for His steadfast love, for His goodness to them when they were in trouble and they cried out to the Lord. In fact, several times in Psalm 107, they, they get into trouble and they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of men. That's why fundamentally we praise the Lord, because of His redemption of us. He's, he's, he's brought us out. He's been our help to forgive us and cleanse us and purify us and bring us to the Father. Ephesians 1 speaks of that great salvation that God has given to us. Right? He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, choosing us from the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Right? In love, predestining us to adoption. And it says several times in that passage, all the benefits that we receive from being, being one in Christ and, and trusting in the Lord. It says, to the praise of His glorious grace to the praise of His glorious grace, to the praise of His glory, like we are saved that we might praise God and to the praise of His glory. We're saved to magnify the grace of God. As 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Right? You're, you're this, this chosen people, this holy race, these, these priests, these kingdoms, Right? so that we may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And 2 Peter 2.10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And now that we have received mercy, now that we become the people of God, our whole purpose is to exalt and to share and proclaim His excellencies from our salvation, from Him helping us. As we find help in the Lord, then that's when we praise the Lord, or as we like to say it, at Rock Valley Bible Church, right, we enjoy His grace. 
that we might extend His glory. Right? We know the grace of God that we might speak forth and give praise to God and extend the glory of God. In fact, it's interesting, this, this aspect of being saved, being delivered, and giving thanks is just such a natural response. You remember when Jesus healed the ten lepers? And, uh, you know, they're far away, and Jesus, they lift up their voices, and Luke 17, the story is told. They say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And then he went to these ten, and he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And they all were, were cleansed. Um, but one of them, when he saw that he's healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell at the face of Jesus and was giving him thanks, right? There's the redemption, right? There's, a, there's the, the rescue, the healing, and coming back and giving thanks to the Lord, even though he was a, a Samaritan. And then Jesus was astonished. He said, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? No one found, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Almost as if giving praise to Jesus and thanking Jesus and expressing that was merely a, a demonstration of his own salvation. He understood it. The others were healed physically, but this man was healed physically and spiritually as he gave praise to God. It was the indication of of what that meant. And, and that's why it's, it was so weird of the nine that they didn't do that because it's a natural response when, when God helps us. Everything God's given us, we turn around and, and praise God. So are you seeking help from God today? Find your help in the Lord. And what's interesting, this isn't so hard. I, I'm not saying, oh, you know, you're in trouble, figure it out. You know, you, you're doing well, just try harder. I'm not telling you to try harder this morning. I'm t- telling you just, just to acknowledge the difficulty you're having and cry out to the Lord for help and find the Lord to be your help and you will be blessed. And then you respond and give praise to God. So you see, God is fully capable of coming to your help in time of trouble because, as verse 10 says, He, he rules and He reigns forever. This gets back to the fact, like verse 6, right? He made the heaven and the earth and sea is all that's in them. He reigns and He rules forever. And then talking to Israel, he says, Your God, O Zion, to all generations. And by the way, these Alleluia Psalms, they're, they're, they're very Israel, Jerusalem, Zion focused, as we shall see. We saw that the God of Jacob. We see Zion coming here in verse 10. We'll see next week in verse 12. Praise the Lord. O Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion. Uh, we will see that in 149 and verse 2. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in his king. But just God's kindness to Israel that now comes to us in Jesus Christ. But he's the one that rules and reigns to all generations. And then the final call there is, Alleluia. Praise the Lord, to which we all are called. So my hope for all of us this morning and for these next four weeks is that we would just be people to praise the Lord, that even today we would just tell ourselves, right, with intention, with purpose, that we might have some purposeful praise. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I would pray, God, that for us at Rock Valley Bible Church, you would deeply teach us, God, what it means to praise you. Just as we look at these Alleluia Psalms, just maybe pull out from them what is needful to praise you and why it is that we need to praise you. Just thank you that you are the one who takes the brokenhearted and you heal them. God, the, the message today is, is simply calling out and crying out to you and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. God, thank you, O oh God, that you're not a, a tyrant demanding of us some things before you save it. No, you just... Re- and call us to to call out and cry out to you. So in that, O God, we do give you great thanks and praise and and pray that you would be with us these next weeks to help us to be a, a better praising congregation. Pray in Christ's name, amen.